a lot of times people compare beer and wine where, you know, the beer guy, he can make another batch next week. Whereas a winemaker, you got to wait till next year. Welcome to the Share the Lord podcast by J. Lord Vineyards and Wines, where we take you behind the scenes over a glass of wine. Let's uncork and dive in. Hi, I'm Josh Baldovino, the marketing manager for JLor Vineyards and Wines, and this is the Share the Lord podcast. In this episode, we are diving into why Paso Robles, and I'll be joined by Steve Peck, our VP of winemaking, and Brendan Wood, our red winemaker. We hope you enjoy. Cheers. Brendan, Steve, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast today. I want to talk about our vineyards real quick. Today is July 2023. Brendan, can you tell us what's going on in the vineyards in Paso Robles? Well, right now it's been doing some walkthroughs in the vineyards and just kind of assessing how much food is out there, assessing the balance of how much canopy there is versus, versus, you know, how many clusters there are, how many grapes are in the clusters, the size of the grapes and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. I know from anyone who is a wine nerd, they'll probably know that, especially in California this year, it is a very different year in terms of weather wise compared to normally. Steve, like, why is it so different this year? Well, yeah, of course, you know, 2023, we just had a, you know, nearly unprecedented amount of rainfall. You know, we're um, two to three times normal, depending on what spot you're in. The way we look at that is that, you know, we've essentially saturated the soil profile. The dirt is moist all the way through down, you know, 10, 20 feet down into the ground as far as the roots can reach. I always kind of think of uh, the beginning of the growing season somewhere between St. Patty's Day and April Fool's Day that in, in most parts of California and in, in Monterey and uh, Napa um, and Paso Robles where we grow grapes, you know, that we'll see the vines come out of dormancy around that time. So in 2023, they just they really had a full cup of, of water to, st- to to get that growth started. And we've seen more foliage growth than than normal. Uh, I guess we call it canopy growth. Um, so a lot of leaves, a lot, lot of long shoots. Instead of two to three foot uh, shoot length on Cabernet and Paso Robles, we're seeing four and five foot uh, shoot length. We're suddenly in need of hedging uh, equipment in the vineyards because, uh, you know, in some cases, even without any supplemental irrigation, the vines are kind of growing together in, in some of our tighter spaced vineyards. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really a remarkable start to, to what we think is going to be a great season. So this year is very different than normal, per se. And just for the, the layman who maybe don't necessarily know the impact of vineyards and what it does to grapes, and obviously then as it pertains to quality of wine, why can't I necessarily just grow grapevines in my backyard? Why do vineyard sites matter? And specifically, Brenda, maybe why, does, why is Paso Robles so good for the grapes that we grow? Well, there's, you know, there's a lot of reasons why Paso Robles is, is, is so great for, for growing wine grapes, growing Cabernet, growing Grenache, growing all sorts of uh, grape varieties. I mean, first of all is the, the climate, you know, is a huge factor in any wine growing re- region around the world. Climate's one of the most important factors there is. And so uh, Paso Robles, we have these real warm days, but cool nights and the cool nights help the grapes um, retain acidity and freshness um, in the grapes, which corresponds to wines that also kind of have these nice ripe fruit flavors, but also some acidity and freshness to, to it as well. So that's a big part. And then if you look around the world, a lot of the really great wine growing, growing regions in the world have calcareous or cal- calcium or, or limestone or some, some version of that, some lime um, calcium-based soils. That's what we have here. We're on what's called the Pacific Plate. Here, it's just a little spot along the, the west coast of California that's on its own different plate than the rest of the United States. And so that, that's an uplifted, uplifted seabed. And that uplifted seabed has a lot of this old calcium and, and, and calcareous type of rock. And that's really a key if you look at, you know, Champagne or Bordeaux or south of France, other growing regions around the world, that that's a common element. And what that does is that that soil that's, you know, heavy calcium base to it, um, it's also will help the grapes kind of retain acidity as well. And so there's those two, between the climate, the, the, the warm days and the cool nights and the, and the soil, um, we get these really nice, big, expressive wines, but they're also have a lot of freshness. 
well. So. so clearly there's a science behind it all. And actually, I think we're going to pivot into this history of J-Lore and Paso just because we're, we're deep diving into it. And Steve, maybe you can help color this in a little bit more. But for anyone who's listening, who maybe wants to own their own vineyard someday, who wants to build a winery, and it's very, very hard to do, if, say, a brand like Jay Lore over 40 years ago moved into Paso Robles, like, how did Jerry do it? And he's now expanded the footprint here, but how do you even start saying, this is the region I want to start producing wine or grapes in? Well, I, I think it all starts out with doing what the neighbors are doing. And, it, and if you're in a well-established area, that's pretty easy to do. But if you're a pioneer, the way Jerry Lore was, where he was early on the scene, um, you know, it's, it's not quite as, as well scripted for you. Jerry, when he planted his first vineyard in 1972 in, in Monterey, which in, in an area that is today known as the Oreo Seco region of Monterey, um, you know, he, there, there, the Wente family was there, Mirsu family was in that area, but not a whole lot of other folks. And the wine styles that were kind of heritage of the 50s and 60s weren't really the wines that he wanted to make. The most popular wine at that time in the United States was probably something called uh, Blue Nun or, or Grey Riesling and, and mm -hmm. these kind of wines. The um, food culture was shifting towards moving away from sweet wines, hamburger helper, and, and, and more towards the, the finer uh, foodie cuisine that we celebrate today. And dry wine was part of that. And so Jerry didn't know exactly what to expect. And even he's a very studious person. And even with all the full consultation of the University of California Davis professors and so on, he ended up planting some varieties that just didn't work. And we, we discovered that Monterey was much more amenable to Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, which was, was a little bit of an obscure variety in those days. And he planted Cabernet Sauvignon in the same area. Did, you know, couldn't, could never get it ripe. So in a way, you can kind of follow what the neighbors are doing, um, but you're going to, uh, you know, if, if you're going to try to um, move the industry forward, you're going to make a few mistakes along the way. And that testing is interesting to me from a marketing side, right? As the marketing manager, and we do ads and social media posts, if a post or an ad doesn't perform well, it's very easy for us to just stop the ad dollars to that specific post and then move the test to a different creative or picture. But on a vineyard planting site, just like on a macro perspective, what does that investment look like? Well, again, yeah. you know, we a lot of times people compare beer and wine where, you know, the beer guy, he can make another batch next week. Whereas a winemaker, you got to wait till next year. But in reality, th th that turnover rate's even much longer than that because uh, the time you make an investment of planting a 5, 10, 20 acre vineyard, it, the idea is that's a 30 year investment. You don't just, you know, you don't just, you know, rip out your mistake a year or two later and, and change varieties and wait another two or three years before you have a crop, right? Yeah, generally, when you're looking at a, a plot of land and putting, thinking about putting grapes on it, you have to think about it in this 30, 30 or 40 year, 40 year time frame, and, and, and you know, it's not like row crops or something where, you know, oh, the, the row, uh, we like it north to south, we think, but now then after a couple of years, you realize, oh, maybe east to west is a better deal, where you, once you put the vines in the ground, that's a commitment. So there has to be a lot of forethought and a lot of, you know, just thinking about the aspect and, and, and the soil type and, you know, the water availability on the, on the land and all, uh, to, to irrigate or not. So there's just a lot of factors that you really have to try to think through. And like S Steve was saying, nowadays, there's a lot of people doing it. So, yeah, you can copy the neighbors easy. Back 30, 40 years ago, it was, it was, you know, there's not a lot of data or not a lot of other people doing it. So you really, I mean, you really had to think through a lot of things. So, yeah, it's impressive. Yeah, yeah, I can't imagine you. There's no internet, right? You can't just Google other research reports so easily and just pull up the no. data. You uh -huh. really have to know who is in the know. And expanding into Pastor Obus from Monterey, how does that even happen? Do you know what other sites he also even looked at before he eventually settled in Paso? Well, the most notable one is is Napa Valley, where uh, you know Jerry, you know 
planted in, in Arroyo Seco in 1972. It took a few years to figure out that Cabernet Sauvignon wasn't working there. So he did, you know, the next somewhat obvious thing, and, and he, he bought 35 acres in St. Helena. The wines are great, but he, you know, we would never have been able to grow, you know, um, to the size brand that we are today, you know, based on Napa Valley fruit. So it, in 72, it's Monterey. In 83, it's, it's St. Helena. And then by 86, that's where he, he put his foot down here in Paso Robles. And that, and that was just through doing a lot of tasting. And it's really interesting. You, you compare it to, you know, running an ad that flops or something like that in your industry. But, but uh, in the wine industry, it's really hard to separate commercial success from like really great tasting wines. Because in some cases, there are some very successful commercial wines. They do really well, but it's harder to find those little gems uh, where producers that are doing something very different, uh, but the wines are fantastic. But if you put that varietal, you know, on the shelf, um, consumers just walk right past it because it's not familiar to them. You know, it falls in that category in our industry. We call it a hand sell. So the wines are amazing, you know, uh, but they come without the tailwinds of varietal recognition, regional recognition, that kind of thing. And for a lot of people, wine is intimidating and scary, and that's probably what it is. Right. If Cabernet is king and Chardonnay is queen most times, especially in publications, on the shelf, if you just walk down the supermarket, there's a big sign that says that. And then there's other reds. It, people just don't know. Right. Yeah. You know, when you go to Baskin Robbins, it's great. Right. They give you the little plastic spoon and let you try as many <laughs> flavors as you want before you commit. Um, but you can't do that when you're at even Trader Joe's or your local supermarket or wine wine store, hopefully you're getting a little more help from the employees there. But uh, restaurants really are the proving ground where you can try something that's a little different that you've never had before, you know. And that's where uh, for us, uh, we've really seen a lot of growth with our Pure Paso proprietary red wine. It falls in that red blend category where historically on, on a restaurant wine list, you'd see the, about the most expensive wine on the list and the cheapest wine on the list, both within that red blend category, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah. it's everything from, you know, Joseph Phelps Insignia, which is a, a red blend, uh, to, you know, Giuseppe's, you know, Spaghetti Red. And <laughs> our Pure Paso blend, it, that's the category. But it... The wine's amazing. And so it's really through restaurants that we've been able to get that word out into the market because um, people see it in the store. They're, you know, might be a little reluctant, but when they, they get a chance to try it, you know, by the glass in a, you know, restaurant environment, that's our w welcome mat, you know, to that experience and worked really well for us. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Living in California... It's so easy, whether you live in Paso Robles and you can go down the street to a winery and do a wine tasting or anywhere in California within a couple hours away from a great wine region with great wineries. But then you think outside of that, the rest of the country doesn't have that luxury. So if you were to paint Paso and maybe even a flavor profile of Paso, what would you say, Brandon? Let's talk about Pure Paso since he's on that. Pure Paso, I mean, we have our, our J. Lore house style and I think that also represents kind of Paso style as well, which is just kind of big, um, real fruit forward wines that butter that are just nice and soft on the palate, you know, that are just really, you know, enjoyable. Um, they're, you know, we, we say this all the time, wines that, that you don't have, you can age if you want to, but you don't have to, you know, and so, you, you know, if you do, if you try the pure Paso and you pick it up at the grocery store or whatever, and you bring it home and you can open it up that night and it's going to be just, it, it's going to be something, a wine that's delicious, that's not, not super pretentious or, or, you know, and people shouldn't feel overwhelmed by wine, you know, it should just be a fun thing. And I think that Pure Paso will fit that and it can go with a lot of different foods. I think for me, some of my favorite wines, you taste it five minutes later, you start tasting some other nuances and it just makes it so interesting, you know, over time, over 
course of a half hour, hour, or two hours, or whatever. If you enjoyed what you were tuning in today, you can get a chance to maybe join us live. We are giving away a trip for two to Paso Robles. And so if you'd like to come sip wines with us, go to jlore.com slash Paso Cabernet, and we'll see you in Paso. Good luck. Cheers. The progression of wine is awfully something that everyone likes to explore because it's supposed to be a living, breathing yeah, product. That's right. Right? Um, Bring it back. Just one last question about Paso Robles. As you talk about the evolution of tasting wine, right, with us being one of the pioneers in Paso Robles, what are some of the different challenges uh, about being in Paso compared to other regions from a producer standpoint? My whole winemaking career has been here in Paso, so I don't know any, anything else other than I, I, and I'm, I'm just I'm happy to be to be you know Paso and representing Paso. I think it's probably the 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 uh, geographically okay. it's a little bit more distant to other to the big cities to metropolitan areas we're about halfway between between the bay area and halfway to to LA so it's a little bit more challenge, challenging to get to um, as opposed to Napa or Sonoma where you can you know fly in and you're an hour or two drive away or whatever so it has that but that's also a benefit and we've seen experience that a lot in the last you know two three four years where now it's really become a destination especially for the weekends and, and things like that. And, and it's, and in the early, earlier years, a lot, you know, the first, you know, 20, 30 years or whatever, it's, it was, it certainly was a less well-known region. And I think it's because it was just harder to, to get to, to access, but, but anymore it's, that is, it, that, that table's turn and, and it's actually kind of the cool place, you know, it's the cool place to get away to and experience some authentic, authenticity. And, and so, yeah. Well, that's the marketing problem. And I guess that's our job to figure out with some of the other associations that are in Paso. Steve, do you have any of the, maybe some of the grower things that are interesting and unique to Paso Robles? Yeah, you know, I started making wines um, in Paso sort of as a hobby back in, I think it was 1995 was kind of my my first year making a, a Cabernet from an area that's now in what we call the El Pomar region. El Pomar in those days was kind of known as the area for Merlot. Um, it was a little too cool for Cabernet. Um, and, of course, the the sub-AVA process where we have, uh, what is it, 11 nested sub-AVAs in Paso Robles now, um, really did help us kind of unravel and collectively a, as a, a community of winemakers and, and, and wine growers um, kind of sort out, you know, some of the complex aspects of, of what does best where, the right varieties for the right places that or, or even varieties that can straddle different locations and we kind of can agree on what attributes of that variety would be emphasized? Again, maybe a, the, the greener character of Cabernet and El Pomar. I don't think there's a lot of growers that would disagree with that. It's a celebration of that kind of minty side. And again, that, that's a component of CR Pure Paso. Our hilltop, if we're going to source it from El Pomar, it's going to have to be from you know, a south-facing slope or a slightly warmer or lighter uh, soil um, type for it to get fully ripe. So it's, it's been uh, fun to kind of see uh, kind of the evolution of that, you know, the Templeton Gap, you know, uh, uh, nobody's going to go out and look for the ripest Cabernet from Templeton Gap. We just know it's a cooler area, you know, more appropriate maybe for Rhones or for Whites, even Pinot Noir does, does fantastic there. Just sort of bringing granularity to all the subregions uh, has been really an interesting progression during my career here in Paso Robles. I mean, I am new, and I still say new to the wine industry. And so clearly, J. Lore has a breadth of experience within Paso Robles. Uh, and I'm really excited to see what happens next. But we'll move on to our bonus pour segment. So I have a fun little question for you. Aside from making wine in Paso Robles, when it is not winemaking time and you're out of J-Lore, what are your favorite things to do in Paso? Um, well, recently, you know, I'm, I have a 13-year-old son, and so recently, um, you know, he's been asking for me, asking, asking for years, you know, hey, let's go fishing. I want to learn how to fish. 
or whatever. But you know, we've had a lot of years of drought the last last couple of years. Well, now now with all the rain, the lakes are full and stuff, and so. I'm learning how to fish. That's been something that's been fun. There's a lot of good lakes around, and of course, you can do some ocean fishing and stuff like that. So that's been a, a, a recent fun, uh, fun thing. You know, catch, catching some bass at Lake Santa Margarita and stuff like that. So that's that's been a good a, a good thing that uh, that you can do around here. And there's a lot more water this year for a sure. Lot, a lot more water <laughs> for sure. What yeah. about you, Steve? Well, I was born and raised on the Central Coast, and you know, Brendan mentioned earlier about you know the Pacific Plate, you know, the, this little sliver of land along California that's west of the the San Andreas Fault. Um, um, I've lived my entire life there, with the exception of my years in Napa in Saint Helena. I, I had a great job, right after college graduation. I could have easily been welcomed into the Joseph Phelps winery where, where I had done my three harvests prior. Um, but it was just a little too far from the beach for me, honestly. Yeah. And, and, and that, you know, that's sad to say, but my career decision in some way had to do yeah. with wanting to get back to the coast. And uh, so I found, found my way to Santa Cruz at that time. And, and now I'm just maybe 100 miles south of there here in Paso Robles. You know, I think my house is 15 miles from Cayuco. So what a really nice, sandy Southern California style beaches. We've got, you know, Pismo. Uh, uh, I think night before last, we, we ran over to, to Moonstone Beach and, and, and had some fish tacos on the terrace there. So from yeah. that, that, that point of view... If you, you know, like the outdoors, then there's an endless, endless, endless thing to do here. If you're a city type of person, you'll miss some of those kind of comforts or whatever. But yeah, you know, we've got this nice mountain range where there's mountain biking or, or hiking or jogging or it just goes... And the other thing you got to remember here, you know, Pass Robles is a tourism destination. Yeah. We really do see our restaurants here punching above their weight yeah. for a, a community of, what are we, 30,000 yeah, people or something time. like that. We're a pretty small town, but the restaurant offerings, whether it's at four bills or two bills on yeah. your little Yelp app or whatever, yeah. it's really good. There's a lot of chefs that that have found that they love the lifestyle of 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 the Central Coast and of Paso Robles, even though they might have been in, trained in New York or San Francisco or, or the yeah. L.A. scene, and they're bringing their game here to our delight. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. So clearly, if we haven't sold you on visiting Paso Robles yet, you definitely have to come out. And if that is not within the cards anytime soon, the next best way is probably to grab a bottle of J.Lor wine. So you can go on to our website, jlore.com. And you can find any of the JLOR Cabernets or wines that we're producing on there. But Brendan, Steve, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers, everybody. <laughs> hey, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you'd like to hear more, don't forget to follow or subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to. And if you'd like to learn more about our wines, you can visit us online at jlore.com. Happy sipping, and we'll see you again soon. Cheers. Cheers.